one of the uh, seminarists who attended these lectures in the fourth part of the week, and he became so um, ecstatic that I thought I'd share his ecstasy with you. He says, uh, we nature hygienists are the happiest people in the world. By, uh, by reason of our living the life of true peace and health and joy. And we are going to bring this blessing to the rest of the world, too. Self-hurting people who live wrongly cannot long resist our message of right living to them. Sooner or later, they all of them must yield to our music of joy and peace and harmony. What a grand world it would then be. No disease, no miseries, no crimes, no wars, which is the biggest crime of all. No evil of any kind. That is an ideal to aim at, and we must realize it. Peace and joy to you and all those you are helping. George Stanley. George Stanley is a, a man who's dedicated to the art of true living in Amsterdam, New York. And I think that he more or less echoes the sentiments of many of us. Tonight, Dr. Shelton is going to speak uh, in a very vi on a very vital aspect of food, which is food preparation. Dr. Shelton. Next time somebody reads a letter from this platform that says that natural hygienists are the happiest people in the world, I hope you don't clap because the rest of the world is miserable. <clears throat> it's all right for us to be happy, but let us not be happy because the other people are not happy. Because we know they're not, of course. I'm supposed to talk to you about something that should not take place. I'm to tell you how to prepare food. But actually, Old Mother Nature does a very good job. And when she finishes her products, we undertake to alter them in our so-called preparation. We usually succeed in injuring and destroying those foods. That is something I think that we should keep always in mind when we go into the kitchen in what we call food preparation. As a small boy, well, as far back as the first day I was born, I used milk. Uh, we always had a cow, or several cows. At one time, my father had a dairy. Uh, at another time, we just had a few cows on the farm. Then we moved into a small town, and we kept one or two cows. And I had milk all of my early life. It was fresh milk from a healthy cow uh, that had plenty of green grass uh, that lived in the fresh air and sunshine and we thrived on that kind of milk. And then it became dangerous to drink milk unless it had been altered. A man in Germany, after investigating what he thought was the cause of tuberculosis for a few years, put forth the theory that tuberculosis in human beings is due to uh, contact, contracting the tuberculosis from the cow in milk, in butter, in cheese, in cow's flesh we got the tubercular germ and we developed tuberculosis the idea caught on very quickly it was accepted by the medical profession as a truth and Louis Pasteur then went set about to try to find a way to destroy these tubercular bacilli, and he hit upon the idea of heating the milk, pasteurizing it, the term 
is the term that has been employed thereafter or since that time to designate what is done. The same German physician went back, however, and conducted a longer and more extensive series of investigation of the same subject and came up with the conclusion that he had been wrong in his first discovery and that human tuberculosis is never, in any case, due to bovine tuberculosis. He presented the new ideas and the new findings at a medical congress in London in the early part of this century. As a consequence of being honest enough to say I made a mistake, he didn't get credit for the discovery of the so-called germ theory. Louis Pasteur was credited with it instead of cut. That's not the way the Germans pronounce that word, but I never was able to get my tongue around German words. <coughs> He was being preened for the honor of being the discoverer of the alleged fact that bacteria cause disease. And when he came up and said, I was wrong, tuberculosis is not caused by bovine, human tuberculosis is not caused by bovine tuberculosis, they said, well, we'll give the credit to Pasteur and set it to Koch. So he got credit. Uh, just the same, from that day to this, we have been pasteurizing milk more and more. Until now, in almost the whole of the United States, it is practically impossible to get anything except pasteurized milk. Even in those localities where there is no, no law requiring the pasteurization of milk, only pasteurized milk is sold. Now, uh, I tell you this because I want to bring to your attention certain facts uh, about pasteurized milk. One of the first facts I'd like to bring to you is this. You can feed calves on raw milk, unpasteurized milk. It doesn't have to be clean, but it's unpasteurized. And the calves will grow and thrive and live. And you can pasteurize the milk and feed the same calves on the pasteurized milk. And if you take 10 or 20 calves at the beginning of your experiment, by the end of 100 days, all but one or two of those calves will have died. Died of malnutrition. Died, some of them will have gone blind before their death. Pasteurized milk is unfit food for calf or human being. Why is it unfit? Because pasteurization alters the composition of that milk in several ways. First, it coagulates the proteins of the milk and renders them less digestible. Second, it deaminizes some of the amino acids of the milk and renders them absolutely unusable to the body, unusable by the body. Third, it alters the calcium salts of the milk so that they are no longer soluble. You feed your child and perhaps yourself during pregnancy plenty of pasteurized milk so that the child will have calcium with which to build bones and teeth and you do not make use of the calcium in the milk. A relative of mine at the age of 14 came to me one day and he said, what am I going to do about my teeth? And he showed me his teeth. He had a number of fillings already and some more cavities and he was only 14. And he said, I've been drinking plenty of milk all my life to supply myself with plenty of calcium with which to build good sound teeth. And yet my teeth are a wreck. And I said, well, now you have been drinking pasteurized milk. He said, yes. Well, I said, you didn't get any calcium. That same thing is true all over the country. Children are being taken into dentist's office at younger and younger ages in spite of all the milk they're drinking because pasteurization so alters the calcium in the milk that it is not useful. Pasteurization destroys almost all of the vitamins of milk. It volatilizes the iodine of the milk so that it passes off as gas. You don't get any iodine when you take milk. It caramelizes the sugar of the milk. It brings about so many changes in the milk and renders it so much less suitable as food as the raw milk that it is not worth while drinking it. Now, 
in New York City, you can buy certified raw milk. I went by the barns where they keep these cows and watched, saw the, uh, the conditions under which they were kept. They're kept in dry lots, most of the time in the sunless barn. They're fed on dry food. They don't get any green stuff to eat. What kind of milk do you think they produce? Dr. Hess of Columbia University took this certified milk and fed it to a group of rats, to another group of rats of the same age and size. He fed pasteurized milk, and he couldn't find any significant difference between the two kinds of milk, the certified raw and the pasteurized milk, meaning that the cows were fed and housed in such a way that they were turning out a milk that was almost as equally devoid of genuine food value as pasteurized milk. So do not depend upon certified raw milk. If you are going to use milk or feed milk to your babies and to your children, you are, and, and if you expect to properly nourish them, you're going to have to make a demand that the milk industry undergo a revolution. Now, why do they pasteurize milk? They say that in New York, for example, the amount of milk that you require is so great and they have to bring it from long distances uh, that they have to pasteurize it to keep it so they can sell it to you fresh. I took some grade A raw milk from a dairy in San Antonio, Texas, put it in an improvised refrigerator that I could carry in the back of my car. It was just an old GI can with a lid to it. And I put ice in the bottom of it and put three quarts of milk in that thing, covered it with paper, and I renewed the ice twice on the way to New York. I drove from Texas to New York, and I had fresh milk when I arrived in New York. It is not true that they cannot bring you fresh milk from distances. <clears throat> the real reason for pasteurizing milk is a simple one. It is to eliminate the competition of the little man. Formerly, the little fellow who produced a small amount of milk could sell his milk in the open market. Nowadays, he must sell his milk to the big creameries, the big dairy industry, because he can't afford to maintain pasteurizing plants. They have eliminated all of that competition. They have created milk monopolies, and that is the sole reason that milk today is pasteurized. It is not done for health because it is not a healthful practice. However, we are not interested in all of the economics of the situation as much as we are in the changes that take place in the milk from application of heat to that milk. Now keep this in mind. The amount of heat applied to milk in pasturing, pasteurizing it is much less than you apply to foods in cooking it. And the amount of heat, I mean the time that that heat is applied is much shorter than you apply to most foods in cooking them. So that the changes that take place in your foods in cooking are often far greater than what take place in milk in pasteurizing that milk. So your foods then are rendered less and less valuable as foods the more you cook them. Let us take bread. It doesn't matter which kind we take, but I'm going to take the most popular bread in the world, white bread. I remember a few years ago we used to, we used to sympathize with the Russians because in spite of all the advances they claimed that they had made, they still had to live on black bread. They didn't have any nice white bread. Not nice, fluffy stuff. It, it makes good paste, that white flour. It makes good paste to put wallpaper on the walls with. But as a food, it's, well, the old saying is absolutely true. The whiter your bread, the sooner you're dead. At any rate, let us take some of this bread, we, this flour. We mix it up with uh, lard or some kind of cooking compound and with milk and we salt it and uh, we put perhaps some other things and we make up a dough and then we put it, uh, cut it into biscuits or some other kind of 
form, we put it in the oven. At the time we put it into the oven, it has a certain amount of food value. Not a great deal, but some. We started cooking. And after a bit of time, it begins to form a little crust on top, and it gets just a little brown. We leave it in a little longer, and the crust gets a little thicker and a little harder and a little browner. We keep it a little longer, and the crust begins to develop some black spots on it. This is charcoal. We leave it still longer, and it gets charcoal all over, and on the bottom side, it gets nice and black. And if you leave it long enough, it gets to be one mass of charcoal. It's black throughout. If you make the oven hot enough and keep it in there a little bit longer, it'll catch fire and burn. But it is not necessary that we convert it to ashes uh, for our purposes this evening. The point I want to make is from the time that dough becomes hot enough to begin to cook until it reaches the charcoal stage, every step of the way involves chemical changes that renders that bread less and less food and more and more foodless substance. Vitamins are destroyed. Of course, there are no vitamins in white flour except those that are put in there, the synthetic vitamins that are put in there to fortify. Now, a woman scientist who is in the Department of Nutrition right at the moment, I don't recall her name, of the University of California took some of this nicely fortified white flour a few years ago and fed bread made from fortified white flour to a bunch of rats. She fed unfortified white flour to another bunch of rats of similar age and condition under similar conditions. Both of them killed the rats, but the fortified bread killed the rats a little earlier. <clears throat> One of the troubles the rats developed was heart trouble before they died, which might help to explain, it, in part at least, why there has been such a great increase in heart disease within recent years. When we cook foods, we destroy food value, we destroy vitamins, we make changes in the starches and in the proteins, we alter the salts so that they are no longer useful to us. And the more we cook them, the less value they possess. Take that bread. When I served in the Army of Democracy back in 1918, that, you remember, I'm going to repeat it, that was the first time we made the world safe for hypocrisy. Oh, I beg your pardon, it was democracy we were working at. And we made the world safe for Hitler the first time and for Stalin the second time, you remember? <coughs> At any rate, I served in the army, and I got into the kitchen. This gave me an opportunity to get my food before the cooks destroyed it. And believe me, I had uh, a remarkable object lesson in the destruction of food in that kitchen. We fed more than 200 men three times a day. I say we fed them. We, we gave them what they call food to eat. <coughs> But I noticed one thing. The boys would eat the bread. And they, it was very nice, soft, fluffy white bread. But they'd take all the crust from around it and leave it on their plates. And they'd eat the soggy, doughy inside of the bread. Now, actual tests, actual tests, feeding tests, have shown that that soggy, doughy inside of that bread possesses more food value than the outside or the crust. Why does it possess more food value? Because it's less cooked. Those portions of the bread that are most cooked are the portions that have the least food value. It is true with every food. The more it is cooked, the less food value it possesses. When you go into a restaurant, well, they start serving the noon meal at perhaps 11 or 11.30, and you get in there at 1 or 1.30. The food that you eat has probably been sitting on the steam table for a couple of hours at the time you get it, still cooking, still steaming, still being, having heat applied to it. Every minute of the time that this goes on, the food value of that substance is deteriorating. Foods that are left over from one meal to the next and are reheated, of course they undergo deterioration while really sitting, standing in a, in a vessel, in the icebox or elsewhere, but if they're reheated, 
they're damaged still more. At the health school there in San Antonio, I've had it going now for a little more than 30 years, we have never once served leftover food. We don't have much leftover food. First place, we organize our work in such a way that we prepare just the amount of food we need to feed our people so that there isn't any waste. But if there is anything left over, well, we have some vegetarian cats that like corn on the cob. They like spinach. They like tomatoes. Uh, they like baked potatoes. They like other foods, and we feed them whatever is left over. There are no leftovers to be fed. Now, that's of the foods that we cook, and we cook very little. Uh, I do not try to serve everybody that comes to my place an exclusive, un exclusively uncooked diet because too many of them are not ready for it. I give them about 75% uncooked foods and about 25% lightly cooked foods, what we call conservatively cooked foods. I'll get to that in a minute. First, it is necessary that I point out to you that all forms of cooking, all forms, deteriorate the value of food. Do they improve their flavor? Some people would tell you yes, and yet I pointed out to you the other night that you can take the finest and most delicious apple that you grow here in the state of New York and eat it in the raw state and relish it. And you bake that apple, and it's flat. It's insipid. It has very little taste. There is no gustatory enjoyment in, to one who eats such a thing. So you drown it in sugar, and you put spices with it and other substances so that you can eat it. You do this with your applesauce. You put sugar and spices into it to give it a flavor, otherwise it is not edible. I went riding with some of my friends who had been patients there, who came into San Antonio, and they wanted to see the city. It was a year or two later after they had been there. They wanted to see the city, so they asked me to go with them for a ride, and I went out, it was Sunday. And after riding around for a while, they wanted to eat. So we drove into a cafeteria, I got a salad and some corn, fresh corn, and I ordered spinach. The spinach, it came, it was soft, it was mushy. You couldn't tell what it had been. It could have been spinach or it could have been dandelion or anything else from the looks of it, you couldn't tell. And it was so mushy that I didn't have to chew it. And it was dark. It didn't have any green left in it. It was just practically black. I took a taste of it. They hadn't added any salt. It didn't have any taste. I, I said to the, to the people, I said, now here is an excellent example of the reason that people put salt on their food. They have taken all of the natural flavor out of this food, and you've got to put something back into it to make it edible, to make it uh, appeal to your palate. Spinach may be cooked conservatively, and no salt added, and it'll be so salty that your friends will swear that you've added salt. I've tried it. I've done it. I've even done it. I've prepared it for a class in dietetics. At the end of the class, I've prepared them a meal and given them spinach that was cooked and no salt added, and they swore that it was salty. And some of them said, I never liked spinach, but this is good. <clears throat> now, when we boil vegetables, we boil the minerals and the vitamins out of the vegetables into the water. We lose large quantities, and the more we chop up these vegetables, the smaller pieces we chop them into before we boil them, the more we lose. If we bake them, they run, the minerals and vitamins run out in the juices into the pan. If we boil them, the same thing takes place. So that all of these methods of cooking involve a loss of minerals and vitamins, a, an alteration of proteins and carbohydrates, a, con a reduction of the food value of whatever food we're cooking. Uh, there are very few exceptions to that rule. If we want to eat an egg, and I never eat them, it's been about 43 years since I ate an egg. It's been 45 years since I ate a piece of flesh. And I'm very anemic, run down and underweight, and weak. I remember once Carlton Fredericks put forth the theory on the, 
on the radio that vegetarians are weak and that they fall down. So I challenge Mr. Frederick to a test. I believe that I'm older than he is. I'll be 64 on the 6th of October. I challenged him to a contest to prove which of us, us meat eaters or us vegetarians, fell flat. First I said, let us have a physical examination, blood tests and everything to determine who is in the best condition. Let some of your meat eating medical men make the test. Then following that, let us indulge in a little physical contest. We'll run, we'll lift weights, or we'll wrestle, whichever you choose. Mr. Fredericks declined the whole thing. He didn't want a test of that kind. He still says vegetarians are anemic. See how pale I am? <clears throat> there is, I have been asked repeatedly, is it possible to live on uncooked foods? Mankind lived on uncooked foods for untold thousands of years before the discovery of fire. We don't know how long man's been on the earth. We guess that he's been here a million years. I could guess another guess, and mine would be as good as that one. But uh, guesses are just guesses. But, and we guess that he learned to make fire about 20,000 years ago. And that still is a guess. But assuming that the guesses are accurate, it means uh, that for nearly a million years, man lived on uncooked foods. Can he do it? <laughs> he did. Many tribes in the earth still live on uncooked foods. And there are hundreds of thousands of people in these United States right now that live on uncooked food. At the turn of the century, we were very much frightened by the story that uncooked foods carry microbes. Lettuce in particular was just teeming with, to, with uh, typhoid, typhoid bacilli. And to eat raw lettuce was to invite typhoid fever. At the same time that that, was, that, that uh, warning was issued and people were told to avoid all uncooked foods, there were 3,000 raw fooders in Chicago alone. Uh, the, the demand for eating raw foods has continued and has grown until even today the medical profession will eat raw lettuce and raw celery. As a matter of fact, lettuce and celery is shipped over this country by the hundreds of carloads. They eat, you can get them in the hotels, you can get them on the trains, you can get them in the restaurants, and you, you have them in your own homes. And people eat them today without fear of typhoid. If you go across the border into Mexico, you're still warned in the same way. Don't eat anything raw. See that everything is thoroughly cooked. Because if you don't, you're going to get some serious disease. Uh, amoebic dysentery is the thing they warn you about most, and yet the raw fooders that I know in Mexico are the people who never have amoebic dysentery. And I know there are a number of raw fooders in Mexico. And I've eaten raw food in Mexico myself, and I've never had amoebic dysentery. I've eaten raw food as far south as uh, Nicaragua. And I still, I am still to have my share of amoebic dysentery. They tell you the same thing if you go to Alaska, if you go to China, if you go to India. My brother was a major in the Air Force during the recent um, World War. He was located in India for a while and in China for a while. There was one other man in his outfit besides him who lived on raw, not totally on raw food, but largely on raw foods. And they ate the foods that they found in India and they ate the foods that they found in China. And they were the only two men in the outfit who did not have amoebic dysentery. Every other man suffered with a dysentery. He went to... to Alaska, after the war was over, was stationed up there for a while, and they were warned in the same way. And the other man was not with him, and he was the only man in the outfit in, that he was with in Alaska who did not have dysentery. And he said to me, they're, they're potato and meat men. All they eat is potatoes and meat. Well, we found out in the Civil War that a predominantly starched diet would produce dysentery. They fed them on beans and potatoes in the Civil War. They nearly killed them all with quinine. <clears throat> there is nothing to fear in eating foods uncooked.
cooking adds nothing to food, but it takes much from them. That is the thing for us to keep in mind when we ask ourselves or somebody else the question, is it possible to live on raw food? The whole animal kingdom does it. Mankind did it for ages, and we still use some raw food. As a matter of fact, there is evidence, there is a certain amount of rather circumstantial evidence that there was a time in the history of the Greeks when they tried to live exclusively on cooked foods, and they got into a very pitiable condition. And they deified the man who taught them to return to uncooked foods and to, to the juices of fruits and to honey, and even he fed them on the juices of raw flesh. Uh, there's considerable evidence of that. In, it's in Greek mythology rather than in Greek history, but mythology is not always mere guesswork or mere myth. It usually has a factual background. One of the worst forms of cooking that was ever invented was the old fireless cooker. Some of you older people will remember that it was a cabinet in which you had your ve cooking vessels and you had a lid on it that you could seal down so that it was airtight and you put, you heated some stones and you put them in there and you put your cooking utensils with the food in it and you sealed down the lid and you went off to town and did your shopping or you went to the theater and saw the, the show and then you came home and you knew that everything was going to be nicely cooked and at the, at the same time it wasn't going to be burned because it wasn't that hot. So you could leave your food cooking and go off. It became a rather popular method of cooking for a time, but the fact is that slow cooking at a low temperature damages food more than quick cooking at a high temperature. It was a very bad form of cooking. At the present time, the pressure cooker is a popular cooker. Cooking foods under high pressure damages them much more and, and damages them more rapidly than cooking them under low pressure are under no pressure. So that, that too is a very w bad form of cooking. If you're not ready to abandon cooked foods completely, if you want to do some cooking, then of course the best thing is to rely upon what we call conservative cooking. And that means cook them very little. Take your greens your spinach, your kale, your chard, your turnip green, your beet greens, and your turnip greens, and the various other greens that you cook. For an ordinary per family of two, three, or four people, spinach, the amount of spinach that they would need at a meal could be cooked in three minutes. It should not be cooked until it changes its color. It should not be cooked until it loses its physical characteristics. It should barely be heated, so to say. It shouldn't lose its juices, and it should be cooked in a waterless cooker, but not in a pressure cooker. There is a difference between the two types of cookers. But it should be cooked very little, and you'll find it to be very tasty under those conditions, and still contains most of its food value. I started to tell you about eggs a while ago, and I, and I got off the subject. The white of an egg is a rather slippery, mucilaginous type of substance that goes slipping and sliding through the digestive tract so rapidly that the digestive juices don't have time uh, to convert it into sub, uh, usable substance. You don't digest the white of an egg in the raw state. If you coddle it or poach it or soft boil it so that it's slightly coagulated, then you will digest it. All right. I don't tell you to eat white of an egg. I don't tell you to eat eggs at all. If you want to eat them, and if you do eat the white, that is the way to take it. By no means beat it up in orange juice or some other type of juice because it is a protein food. And the taking of acids with protein interferes with the digestion of that protein. When you take acids into the stomach, I'm going into this more fully in the lecture on food combining. When you take acids into the stomach along with your protein foods, the, the presence of the acids inhibits the outpouring of gastric juice for two hours or more, which means that retar you, you retard the digestion of protein. Retarded digestion favors putrefaction. Retarded digestion favors fermentation. We want to eat in such a way as to 
provide the least amount of hindrance to the digestive process. We want to respect in our eating habits the enzymic limitations of, uh, in our digestive tract, or I should say the limitations of our digestive enzymes, so that we can have the best of digestion, not merely something to get by with. The American people are spending millions of dollars a year for Alka-Seltzer, Bellans, Pepto-Bismol, and various other substances of that kind to relieve their after eating distress, brought on very largely by reason of the fact that they're eating combinations that no digestive tract in existence can digest efficiently. We'll go into that, as I said, more fully in the class on food combining. And I'll give you the, something of the physiology of digestion in order to enable you to more clearly understand the rules for food combining that we give you. In cooking flesh, how, how many of you eat flesh? Well, I don't know why I should tell you how to cook it. There's only about four hands. Well, I'll better tell you anyhow. If there's that many of you that bury the carcasses of dead animals in your stomach every day or every other day, I better tell you how best to do it. Your flesh should be fresh. Now, how do you get it? There's only one way to get fresh flesh. And that's to go out and kill your game yourself. If you buy fresh meat in the butcher store, in the butcher store or in the meat market, it may be anywhere from a few days to several years old. It's embalmed. It's morgue meat. It's nicely embalmed. It's preserved with chemicals. It's been kept on ice, of course. Once I went into the uh, refrigerator of the, of the Western Reserve University where they kept the cadavers that they used for, uh, for dissection. Professor Sassaman, the professor of anatomy there, was put me in there to show me to sit around. And, he pulled out a few of the bodies and uh, he pointed to some little white spots here and there on these bodies and he said, do you know what these spots are? It looked like, almost like little spots of snow. They meant they were anything from the size of a quarter to larger than a dollar. And I said, no, Professor, I'm afraid I'm not sure what those are. He says, those are colonies of microbes. Now, we keep these things in this refrigerator and we keep the temperature below zero, uh, not below zero, below freezing, and we have these things saturated with formaldehyde. And in spite of that, these colonies of microbes grow here on this stuff. Uh, now you can imagine how fresh your meat can be under those circumstances. They grow. The, the meat undergoes a certain amount of putrefaction. putrefaction. Uh, even though it is kept in a refrigerator, and even though it is embalmed, and even though there are chemical preservatives added, it does undergo putrefaction. So you don't get fresh meat, but it should be. If you're going to eat meat, it should be fresh. And then it should be either baked or boiled. It should never be fried, and it should never be boiled. <clears throat> How many of you eat soup? Soup is one of the worst foods we can take. You, everything that you put into it may be wholesome food. And yet you make, you put in a lot of water and you boil it. And you boil out the vitamins and minerals into the water, then you take it. But you are taking that food, what food you have there, along with a lot of water. And of course, digestion is very poor. And then if you take other foods with it, it interferes with the digestion of those other foods. Any fluid taken into the stomach will dilute the digestive juices. It will dilute the enzymes so that you don't have enough enzymes and enough, enough uh, uh, digestive juice to carry on digestion in a normal way. This is the reason we advise you not to drink with meals, nor after meals. Some of you think, well, I can eat... I can eat this meal, and then after the meal, I can have a drink. Or two hours after I eat a meal, I can have water. And that is not a wise practice either, but we'll go into that more fully when we come to the, uh, to the lecture on how to eat. Of course, I'm going to tell you people how to eat, and every one of you assume that you already know how. 
You know how you do it, anyhow. But there are many mistakes in our modern eating habits. We are, are inclined to think that we eat today like our ancestors ate, and that our ancestors ate like we did. And yet, the further back in human history we look, watch, and study human eating habits, and hum human eating practices, the more conscious we become of the fact that modern eating practices are really modern. They, they are less than 200 years old. We commit many mistakes in our conventional eating practices. Soup, we like to thicken it with tapioca or with starch or with some substance of that kind. Soaked starches do not digest. Starches that are soaked so that they take up a lot of water and they're saturated with water, you can take them into your mouth and chew them and chew them and chew them until they come, become blue in the face, and they will not increase in bulk because they do not excite the flow of the, of the salivary juice, uh, nor the flow of the salivary enzyme, and they do not undergo digestion. Take a dry starch and chew it, and the longer you chew it, the more bulky it becomes because it absorbs a lot of saliva. And it it, fill, it fills up with the saliva and becomes more bulky. But also there's a lot of enzyme poured out upon it, and if you keep that dry starch in your mouth long enough, it'll become sweet because the process of digestion, that is, of converting that starch into sugar, begins right in the mouth. So when you thicken soups with starches of any kind, from any source, you make a serious mistake and you prepare yourself for indigestion, which calls for some of that effervescing Stuff, stuff that they sell under the name of, uh, of alka seltzer. I'm not advertising alka seltzer, by the way. Uh, I'm trying to point out to you that if you, be, if you live sensibly, you don't have to spend your money for drugs. Uh, if you don't live sensibly, the drugs won't help you anyhow. They'll give you a few minutes of respite from your discomfort, but they don't save you from the ultimate consequences of your violations of the normal conditions of life. I remember when Rudolf Valentino died. I was on the st staff of the New York Evening Graphic at that time, and I had a, a page each day, in, a column rather, each day in the graphic. And I watched that case very carefully. Mr. Valentino had been suffering for years with digestive troubles. And uh, upon advice of his physicians, he had been taking, after each meal, from baking soda. Well, now baking soda is one of the ingredients in Alka-Seltzer. The other is aspirin. It's a combination of aspirin and bicarbonate of soda. He had been taking bicarbonate of soda following each meal for a number of years because he was eating in such a way that he was suffering with gas and sour eructations and distress after each meal. Instead of telling, teaching him how to eat to avoid the suffering, uh, the eruptations and the gas and the acidity. They said, just take some baking soda. So he continued it until finally he came down with an ulcer of the stomach. So what do you do when you have an ulcer? Well, you remove the ulcer with an operation. Mr. Valentino was hospitalized there in Brooklyn and an operation was performed. They had several physicians and nine nurses on the case. Now that's enough to kill anybody. I remember in World War I, we used to have that song about being in love with a beautiful nurse. I don't want to get well, I don't want to get well, I'm in love with a beautiful nurse. But nine beautiful nurses is just too many. <clears throat> they told Mr. Valentino, yes, it'll be all right. He's here he is, lying here in bed, suffering with an ulcer of the stomach, just following, has an operation, and he's not healed. It's all right, you can smoke. You see? They, they never think that it is necessary to make any corrections at all in the mode of living of the individual. You can just do anything you want to do. You can eat as haphazardly and as indiscriminately as it is possible to do. You can practice all the bad habits that we in civilized life have cultivated. And in America, we have all the bad habits of all the people of all the earth. The Indians only had tobacco. They just had one drug habit. We traded them fire water for their tobacco. It was like two bums sleeping together. One had the cooties and the other had the itch, and they, they traded with each other. 
And then we went to Arabia and got coffee. And we went down into South America and we got cocoa and chocolate. Uh, and we went to China and we got opium. And to, and to India and we got tea. And we brought all the drug habits of all the earth into America and we cultivate all of them. Not being satisfied with these, we made up some more in, salt, in, what, in what we call soft drinks. And they, only call them, they call them soft drinks only because only soft saps drink them. But we really have a bundle of them, and nobody wants us to quit. The researcher is told that you must not discover anything that will disturb the habits of the people, the habits and conventions of the people. If it disturbs it, lay it aside. It, we don't want to disturb them. Let them have their fun. As a matter of fact, I think it's part of the, of the game to keep people from thinking. If you can keep them under narcosis, alcohol and tobacco, or if you can keep them stimulated with tea and coffee, uh, they won't think on vital issues. Then there is that other opiate of the people. You know, it was Karl Marx who said that religion is the opiate of the people. Well, we have many opiates of the people today, and religion, if it is an opiate of the people, is rather, well, it's taken a back seat. Radio and television today, and sports, are our opiates of the people. These are the bread and circuses with which the modern Caesars keep our minds off our vital issue. <clears throat> so, Nothing was done to correct the mode of living of Mr. Valentino. The, if you have something wrong, don't remove the cause. Remove the organ or part of it. If, the, if you have inflamed tonsils, don't, remo don't remove the cause of inflamed tonsils. Remove the tonsils. If you have a headache, don't remove the cause of the headache. Cut off the head. I guarantee you that when the head is removed, you'll never have another headache. <laughs> you can't get a head that way, but <laughs> that's true. <coughs> now, starches are sub substances that should be eaten dry, never soaked. Therefore, don't put them in soups. Starches, if they're to be cooked, should not be boiled. You know, you like to take your oatmeal and boil it, or your rice and boil it, or, or your farina and boil it and make it into a mush. Then you put in some sugar, white sugar, of course. Then you pour in some milk, pasteurized milk. Or maybe you get cereal cream, which is still no. They don't sell you any cream. They sell you milk. I, I know because I used to be on the inside of the dairy industry. I know what milk, when you sell cream, I know what they sell it for. It sells very high. I know how they adjust their cream separator. You can adjust a cream separator so you can get pure butter fat. Or you can adjust it so you get 90% milk and a little cream. And I know how it's worked. I, I also know that you never get anything that, that you call raw sugar. I mean, it's not raw, because I've helped to make sugar. I've helped to harvest the cane. I've carried it to the mill. I've helped to, to make, cut it into pieces and press out the juice and help to make the sugar and the molasses, the syrups, and all the things that we get from the cane. I, I know that it's not raw, and I know that it, the so-called raw sugar doesn't have all the value that we like to attribute to it. I know that your syrups and your blackstrap molasses and all those things that some of the lecturers make so much fuss about has been subjected to long periods of boiling in the process of making them, in reducing them in, in, uh, in uh, taking out most, much of the water so that you can make a syrup rather than having a juice. So that they do not have the value that you're told they have. And I know too from having used these things in my childhood, I've given them up, I gave them up years ago. I know from having used them that there are very few things that you can eat that can cause more gas and distress than molasses. <clears throat> Thank you.
these, uh, this cookie that we are so fond of should be done, if done at all, very lightly in order to damage the food as little as possible, in order to lose as little of their flavors as possible. It's possible to cook them lightly, some of them, not all of them. It's possible to cook them lightly and have them so that you can relish them without the addition of salt and pepper and si sugars and spices and other things to provide a taste that you have already cooked out of. Old Mother Nature packs her foods with savors of various kinds, and you spoil them in the cooking process. Suppose you're going to cook a potato. Now, I haven't found anybody anywhere in the United States that knows how to bake a potato. Everywhere I go, that I, if I order a baked potato, I get a gooey, soggy something that has no taste. And chiefly, this, this is due chiefly to the fact that they insist on getting large potatoes. A large potato will not bake well. If you want to bake potatoes, get an egg-sized potato. Get an egg-sized potato, and it'll bake nicely. You'll get a nice, mealy, tasty potato without that soggy, gooey uh, appearance and taste that doesn't have much taste, as a matter of fact. You can eat a properly baked potato without adding butter to it, but you can take these other kinds, and if you don't add something, they just don't, they just don't appeal to your sense of taste. You want to bake, you want to cook your carrots. Now, they're better raw. They're tastier raw. They have more food value raw, but you want to cook them. So you cut them up and you, you cut them in strips or you cut them, you dice them, you put them in the pot and you boil them and you boil them and you boil them. And by the time you get through with them, all the food value is in the pot and you eat the husk. Take your carrot and scrub it with a brush. Get it clean. Leave it whole. Cook it in the skin. It'll be a hundred times more tasty and it'll contain most of its food value with a minimum amount of loss. The same with a squash. I went into a place the other day and they had squash on the menu and uh, I said, well, what about this squash? Is it young tender squash? No, it's big things. He cut it into small pieces to cook. I said, well, I don't want any squash. When I buy squash, I buy only small squash, little fellows. Still young and tender, still full of vitamins. Every part of it is edible. Every part of it is digestible. The cellulose in that squash has not reached the indigestible stage. The seeds are still un unformed. I cook that squash whole. I don't cut it up. I put it in a vessel whole and cook it whole. It only takes a few minutes. And it is, the, it is a hundred times tastier without the addition of anything. You don't have to add salt to that squash or butter to it. You can eat it just like it is, and it's tasty. Beets the same way. Turnips the same way. Now, I don't advise the eating of onions. Some of you do eat them. If I would, were cooking onions, I would cook them whole. I wouldn't cut them up in small pieces and then cook them. I would cook them whole, and they're very sweet. Even the most even the most uh, uh, fiery onion that you can buy will be sweet under those circumstances. Of course, the mustard oil in the onion evaporates in the cooking process. The reason for not taking onions largely is the fact that they are abundant in mustard oil, which is an indigestible substance and a highly irritating substance that is eliminated through the kidneys. And I'm convinced that the eating of onions, garlic, leeks, chives, scallions, and things of that kind containing this mustard oil eating them in the raw state, so you get a lot of that mustard oil. I'm convinced that it is one of the causes, not the cause, but one of the causes of kidney trouble. I, I've seen something else. I've seen many women who could eat an onion, and within, within half a day after they ate the onion, they would have burning and irritation of the, of the opening of the vagina. And every time they ate an onion, it would do that. If they did not take onions in their diet, they would not have that irritation. This only indicates to me that this type of substance, 
These substances that are rich in, mineral, in, in mustard oil are not suitable for human consumption. But the oil is evaporated in cooking, and if you cook it, cook it very lightly and cook it whole, and then you relish it. Get back to the beginning before we end. Let me again emphasize this point, that any form of cooking, even what I call conservative cooking, damages and impairs the value of any food that is employed. I never learned to relish an Irish potato in the raw state. Dr. Curcio told me he had the same trouble. He never learned to relish it. I've seen Irish people. I don't know whether anybody else ever did this or not, but I've seen Irish people who ate the Irish potato in the uncooked state, and they seemed to think it was as good as candy. Uh, when my children were young, they used to take green beans, and, and raw green beans, uncooked ones, and eat them like candy. Uh, I never could relish raw green beans. Uh, there's, uh, it may be that if I'd been forced to live on it uh, for a long time, I might have learned to do it, but I never did. Some of the foods we don't relish in the raw state. But I, I always leave those, I think it best always, to leave those foods out of our diet. On the other hand, I would like to point out this thing to you. If you don't like a food, if it's a good food, and you find that you don't like it the first time you eat it, that is not a reason for rejecting it, just because you personally do not like it. Many people like a food and others don't. If it is a good food and you personally do not like it, that is not a reason for rejecting it. And I, I would say this to you, that if we put forth as much effort to learn to like the wholesome foods that we don't like, as we put forth in learning to like tobacco or in learning to like the taste of beer. I never tasted beer but once in my life, and it tasted like last week's dishwater. I spewed it out of my mouth and threw the bottle away, and I never tasted it afterwards. But people make such strong efforts to learn to like these things. I, I experimented with tobacco when I was a little fellow, and I told you the other night some of my experiences with snuff. I experimented with chewing tobacco and with cigarettes and with cigars and with a pipe. I never got to the point where I didn't get sick. But I could have, just like the rest of it, I could have gotten to the point where I could have t smoked three or four packages of cigarettes a day. As a matter of fact, I might have been dead by now with cancer of the lungs if I had been foolish enough to go ahead and learn to smoke, learn to like, let me call it, the taste and the flavor of tobacco. But I never did. I didn't put forth the effort that is required to beat down the protests of my not natural instincts and to pervert them so that I could like the flavor and taste of tobacco. But if we just would put forth the same kind of effort in learning to relish the wholesome things of life that we do in learning to think we like the unwholesome things, there is hardly anything that is wholesome that we could not learn to relish in any state that would be best for us. I have seen people in the South, you know, down there where we had a lot of malaria when I was growing up. I never had malaria in my life, and I used to sleep outdoors all summer, and I was just bitten a thousand of times by the malarial mosquitoes. And for some reason or other, they didn't give me malaria. But I, see, I saw other people have malaria time after time, and quinine, you know, was the great remedy, and also the great preventive. Of course, it didn't prevent, and it didn't remedy. But it, it was supposed to do that. We learned in the Civil War that it would neither prevent nor remedy diphtheria. I mean, uh, malaria. We, uh, we fed, in the Northern armies, we fed uh, quinine to the soldiers with their meals. We fed it to them in large doses. And they still had malaria in great numbers. And then we increased the dose when they got the malaria and they died like rabbits. 
We knew at the end of the Civil War that quinine would neither prevent nor remedy malaria, and yet we still talk about quinine as a great preventive. We vaccinated all of our soldiers in, in, in the Philippines against malaria, and we had plenty of quinine on hand, and we had more deaths from malaria among those soldiers than we did from Japanese bayonets and bullets. And we're still talking about quinine as a preventive and as a cure for malaria. Uh, but what I wanted to point out is I saw the old fellows down there that were used to taking quinine. They'd take a large dose of quinine just by itself, the bitterest substance that you can think of, pull out that tongue and put it on the tongue and swallow it, and not even make a face. Uh, speaking of the cure of, of malaria with quinine, I remember one of the remedies that they used to have. They would take a spoonful of sage in one hand and a spoonful of salt in the other hand. And the poor fellow sitting there shaking in the, in the, in the, with, the with the malaria, and he would take a lick of salt and a lick of sage. A lick of salt and a lick of sage. And he kept that up until both the sage and the salt were swallowed. Actually, I saw as many recoveries from malaria <laughs> Follow that kind of program is follow the taking of quinine. And I'm sure that as bad as these two substances are, they are not nearly as damaging as that protoplasmic poison, quinine. <coughs> but these men had taken so much quinine they could take it uh, just as though it was candy. They seemed to relish it. They had kept on taking it and taking it and taking it. So we can learn to like any wholesome food, if you don't like it the first time, I remember the first time I ate an avocado. I didn't like it. I brought some avocados up one time to a place here in Ohio where I was ant living. I, I was really taking the avocados on to New York with me. I had them in my car. I was going there to lecture, and I wanted to have them to eat. And I was talking about avocados to my aunt and her family, and they had never heard of them. So I went out to my car and I got some ripe ones and took them in. And they, they each took a bite of avocado. And they said it tastes like a mouthful of lard. <laughs> I didn't like avocados the first time I took them either. And the first time I ate a stalk of celery, I didn't like it. And I don't like the celery we buy nowadays. Celery is getting worse and worse. If our agricultural methods are not changed soon, for the better. The time is rapidly approaching when we aren't going to have anything that's tasty to eat. Even the fruits are reaching that point in their deterioration where they don't taste good any longer. It isn't my sense of taste. I find that with everybody. They're all complaining about it all over the country. They're complaining about the taste of the fruits and the vegetables. We're over-fertilizing them with commercial fertilizers. And in California in particular, they're over irrigating so you get a plum that should be a nice like the uh, Santa Rosa plum it should be a nice sweet very tasty plum and you get it it has a watery taste with no sweetness in it it's watery they over irrigate we're ruining our food supply by our forcing measures and by getting them on the market too early in other words the food industry has become just that an industry seeking profits and it cares not a whit about quality, uh, it only wants quantity, and to get it on the market, in the market, on the market in a hurry. So we're going to have to have considerable change in our food industry in the not near future, or we aren't going to be a nourished people at all. We also all, we already kid ourselves with the thought that we're the best nourished people on the earth. It's true enough that we eat more than anybody else, but we're eating l less food, genuine food, than the other people. We're taking in a lot of bulk that has no value. Mr. Gould is standing over here making faces at me again. So I'm going to sit down and give him the floor a minute. <laughs> I think I can sum up Dr. Shelton's wonderful lecture by saying that cooked foods are not what they're cooked up to be. Is that right? 
I want to bring to your attention the fact that we just have a very few copies left of uh, what I consider to be one of the finest guides that uh, Dr. Shelton has written on food combining, which, by the way, is his next subject tomorrow. Uh, I'm pretty confident that when he lectures tomorrow on this very salient subject, there will be no books left. So I urge you, when you go out to get one of these books, it's only one dollar. And I'm sure that you'll find it of everlasting benefit for yourself and family. We'll have a few questions now from the audience. All right. Uh, we have to get rid of them as much as we can. There isn't any, there isn't any way to overcome all of them. You have to, uh, that, no, you don't have to have them in order to produce a crop. They're not producing them without them. Is the truth? Is the truth? Is the true statement that they have to have them? Is another thing. We can have fruits and vegetables without poison sprays if we would reorganize our agricultural industry we need a remineralization of the soil either one or both and in the meantime we have got to thoroughly wash and scrub our fruits and vegetables and that only gets off most of it it does not get off all of it all right have we another question uh, Uh, it's true enough that some of these some of these sprays, some of these poisonous sprays are accumulating. It's also true that the body can eliminate some of them. Some of them are stored in the bones and in the liver, and some of them are accumulated, like the arsenic in the sprays, for example, is cumulative, and it is one of the causes of cancer. Well, I... If I were feeding egg yolk with juice, I, I would use a vegetable juice rather than a fruit juice. Uh, I would prefer, however, to feed the egg yolk with the whole vegetable salad rather than with the juice. All right, have we another question? Yes. You. Yes. What would I say if he's ready for it? When he makes up his mind that he wants to live on an all raw food diet, it, is, it doesn't require any necessary physical preparation. It's a mental preparation that you have to undergo. Some people are not mentally ready to undergo, to take up a raw food diet. No, you don't have to have a purification first. You can just break off abruptly from your old cooked diet and go on the raw food diet. You don't need any transition diets or any preparatory fasts or anything of the kind. Any more questions? All right. Is there any value in what? Millet. Millet is, is a cereal. I, I do not class cereals as among the best articles of diet for human consumption. They make good foods for certain types of animals such as birds and horses and so forth. But they're not the best of foods for man. Among the cereals, millet is one of the best. All right, have we another question? Does everybody know all he wants to know? I, I think we could safely say that, that if they taste good to the people in general, not to a particular individual, they'd be safe to eat. Mankind is equipped by nature with instincts that guide him in his choice of food. But in civilized life, our instincts have been so badly abused and perverted and misused and suppressed, and the foods that we take have been so 
prepared and camouflaged that our instincts are not reliable guides. In a state of nature, with foods as nature produces them, they would be guides. But you can take enough honey and that you can uh, camouflage a highly poisonous substance and take it into your body uh, past your instincts, that is, uh, your, ta your sense of taste and smell, it'll get past the sentinels that Mother Nature has established at the entrance to the digestive tract and get into your stomach without you knowing you're taking a poison. That is, if you, secret, if you, if you carefully hide it in honey, when it gets into the stomach, it'll be found out down there anyhow. But we are equipped, we were originally equipped, with instincts that were as reliable guides to man as the instincts of the animal are reliable guides to the animal. When we abandoned our instinctive life and began uh, what we might call an experimental existence, we ran into a lot of trouble, and we're still experiencing that trouble. All right, have we another question? Yes. Tomatoes only with protein? I would feed tomatoes only with such proteins as cheese and nuts, not with eggs and not with flesh. No, not with starch, no. Oh, I didn't finish that. Is that what you mean? Well, you can't prepare it without the use of water. I, I said soap starches do not digest. You steam it until you have it the desired softness, then you spread it out in a pan, and put it in the oven, and dry it, and eat it dry. You've got good teeth, you can follow the Scott plan. You just scald it. You don't cook it, you just scald it and then eat it. Well, it doesn't matter about the proportion. You're just steaming the rice to start with. You're not boiling it. A vaporizer in heating food? Uh, I do not think that the use of a vaporizer would be, would be of any advantage. You'd still have deterioration of food value in employing it. All right, I might point out at this point, too, that when you hash foods, when you dice it, when you shred it, when you cut it up into small pieces, or when you run it through a food chopper, when you pressurize it with a, with a blender and things of that kind, you let the oxygen of the air to the food, and it oxidizes and it loses value. You can lose 70% of the vitamin C in lettuce, for example, in 60 seconds by running it through a food chopper and letting the oxygen of the air to the substance. I feed tomatoes at my place whole. I never slice them for the same reason. Sliced tomatoes and the vitamin C is soon all destroyed by oxidation, even at room temperature. We feed them whole. Uh, we feed lettuce. If we use head lettuce, we cut it in half or quarter it. We never cut it up in small pieces. We serve lettuce the whole stalk, not pieces of it. We do not cut that up. Uh, we, if we're serving carrots, we never shred them. We never shred anything for the reason that it does, the food does oxidize under those conditions and it does lose considerable food value and it loses flavor. All right, have we another question? Yes. Well, all of these things are, are important. I mean, they're, they're important as, as sources of discomfort, of disease and evil. But our discussion was primarily on food preparation rather than all of, all of those substances. Have we another question?
There is a certain amount of oxidation of food in the process of chewing. But inasmuch as your mouth is kept closed, or should be, while you do your chewing, less oxygenation takes place. <laughs> you shouldn't talk while you chew. What's that? It depends on the stage of development of the corn, whether it is starch. Young tender corn taken directly from the corn, corn stalk and eaten right away has practically no starch in it. It's sugar. But within 24 hours after it's taken off the stalk, it undergoes quite a bit of change and you've got a lot of starch in it. Well, I think we've answered all the questions today. We'll have some more tomorrow at 2.30. Thank you.